Broadway Beats, Broadway Beats, Broadway Beats, Broadway Beats. Hello, I'm Richard Ridge, and welcome to Broadway Beat, where we bring you the very best of what the New York theater scene has to offer. This week we look at a new musical, a new take on a classic play, and a new CD. We'll drop by the opening night celebration for the new musical Memphis, which has just rolled into the Schubert Theater, created by Joe DiPietro and Bon Jovi's David Bryan. We'll also visit with Finian's Rainbow star Kate Baldwin for the release of her new solo CD called Let's See What Happens. But let's start things off at the opening night party for Roundabout Theater Company's new production of Patrick Marber's play, After Miss Julie, which is his version of the classic Strindberg, Miss Julie. It's playing at the American Airlines Theater under the direction of Mark Brokaw and stars Sienna Miller, Johnny Lee Miller, and Marin Ireland. After Miss Julie transposes August Strindberg's 1888 play about sex and class to an English country house on the eve of labor's historic landslide in 1945. Do you think I'm a dreadful lush? No, my lady. I think I'm a dreadful lush. Now a toast to me. To you. To you. To me. To socialism. To socialism. To peace. To peace. What else? To love. To love. To the workers. The workers! Bravo. I wrote it about 15 years ago uh, when the BBC sent me the play and asked me to adapt it for television, in fact. And over the years, it's been done on stage, and I've rewritten it every now and then in little bits. I always like to fiddle with my plays a bit, and I've had a little fiddle here. Tell me what you loved about the play originally, Strindberg's Miss Julie. Well, I didn't love the play originally. I was fascinated by it, but I felt it, it needed some kind of different take on it to make it m more comprehensible to a modern audience. Yeah. So I was, I was amazed by Strindberg's play, but I couldn't say I loved it. I love the way you said it in the 40s. Was that something you always wanted to do when you started working on the play? It was something that occurred to me when I was reading the Strindberg play. It was an, an immediate sense I had that I wanted to s relocate it to England in this period. And I still can't quite remember why, but that's what I did. He, the reason why I was interested in doing this play is because I felt that his placing it in 1945 England made it very pertinent and present for me. You know, just having gone through the election we went through in October, or October in November with Obama. Um, and I felt that it was an, a play that would connect with an audience today because we would understand what it, was, what it would be like to be a part of a night where we felt the whole world was changing and where all was possible and where the whole social order was changing uh, and a whole new party was being swept into power and that's really what the catalyst for the start of our play is. Mark, talk about working with this cast, talk about the rehearsal process, what that was like and then putting it up in the theater. Well, the great thing about this cast is that they have just been fearless from the get-go, which is what you need if you're going to work on this play because it really requires you to go to some difficult places and um, it requires a real attention to detail and a meticulousness and uh, an emotional commitment that I think these actors are really willing to give. And so it's been exciting you know, to work with them every day and, and incredibly rewarding. And I think that they have really grown over the five weeks we've been working here in the theater. I was a mistake, really. You're illegitimate. Mm. Funny, isn't it? So they had to get married, and she brought me up as a child of nature. She wanted me to demonstrate the equality of the sexes. She used to dress me up in boys' clothes. She made me kill a fox when I was... And then she began to stay out all night. She took lovers. People talked. She blamed my father for... They rowed constantly and fought. She often had terrible gashes and 
bruises he did too she was very strong when she was angry and then there was the rumor that my father tried to kill himself yes he failed Exhausted, <laughs> um, so excited, and you know it's it's such an intense play, and so coming off stage as always, it takes a moment to kind of regroup and gather. But I'm I'm so excited. It's my dream come true tonight, and I can't believe I've opened on Broadway. I can't believe it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the role and what makes her so wonderful to play. Well, you know the versatility, where she begins and where she ends in the story is pretty extreme, and. Um, and, you know, she's incredibly bright and incredibly damaged. Um, and those roles are really fun as an actress to play. She's got a great wit and a sharp tongue, and it's Patrick Marber. And I've got an amazing cast around me, an amazing director, and it's just been a, a, a dream project, really. When you and I spoke the first time, it was during rehearsals. What has it been like performing with these other two wonderful actors? Well, just, it's heaven. If, if for one minute you drop the ball, I just only have to look at, at both of them and be right back in the play where I should be. And they're so dedicated and committed. And we're obviously incredibly close. It's just the three of us in this crazy piece. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a family. We have to be, but we love each other. And, and they're, they're just both immensely talented. I feel hugely honored to share a stage with them. And working here at Roundabout, what the experience has been like for you, could you say something about it? Well, it's just the Roundabout, you know, I don't have much experience in theatre at all. This, you know, I've done one other play, but there's not a second that's gone by where I haven't felt completely supported. I think they, they genuinely care so much about our well-being and, and us having a good experience doing this. I think they do incredible work, and it's a family, again. It's, it's an incredible system that they have set up, and I'm honoured to be working with them on this. And just talk a little bit about the audience's reaction here at the American Airlines to the play. <laughs> They're great. You know, the play takes some very sharp twists and turns, and, and people are shocked, and, and people in New York are vocal about that, and that's great. That's great for us, you know. Um, they kind of gasp and scream and laugh and clap and it's they seem to be very behind us and very into the play into the story um, but the audience tonight was fantastic they were great I could hear my father's laugh a lot so that that was fun there's so many things um, but I guess also that I love how much she hangs on to her own dignity in such a clear way and and I love that she's got such an interesting relationship with her own emotions <laughs> And it always surprises me, I have to say, what happens next. I always have to keep kind of, I feel like her dialogue with herself, uh, what I've learned about her, or at least what, you know, what I've learned about this play, is that her dialogue with herself is sort of louder than her dialogue with everybody else. You know what I mean? And all those times she's alone on stage and, and these moments sort of navigating her intense emotions and whatever, that happens, that's her own business. You know what I mean? As opposed to the other two of them where it's kind of laid out for everyone to see. And I think that's a really specific challenge. I don't know that I, you deal with too often in theater. Usually it's right out there. And so for me to get to explore that kind of terrain is very thrilling for me. And talk about your fellow cast members. Oh, God, I love them so much. <laughs> I really do. They kind of couldn't be two more generous or brave people. Um, they're absolutely fearless, and I feel like I learned so much about that from them and um, watching them kind of throw themselves into this thing. And, um, you know, they're so unbelievably kind, and it's, I think it's the only way you can ever attack a piece that's, that's dark in any way, is you're, you're sunk if there's not that kind of love between the people. There's, there's, there's no way out otherwise, so that's the, that's the only way you make it through. These need a wash. I woke in the night. I opened your door. You both had your backs to me. I was wondering if you'd tell me, since we are to be married, for better or worse. Of course I'd have told you. I'm sorry. Don't bother. I imagine you did it with every little scrubber in France. I have low expectations. I'm rarely disappointed. I understand. How could you resist her beauty when you're just a man? 
it's been amazing and to get to do you know when you do 40 previews as well it's quite an extraordinary experience for me and it, uh, um, it's just been an absolute joy quite frankly I mean ho hopefully um, we feel we feel that the audiences we've been showing it to have been enjoying it um, and or, and been quite shocked and taken aback by the play and, and been made to think about it we've had good feedback so far so that's all you can ask, really. Um, we just do the we just do the best job we can, and I, I love this theatre. We were, we were all quite concerned about this theatre before because it's quite grand looking and it's very wide. And we thought the play needed an intimate, intimate space, but it's more intimate, apparent for the audience than we thought it was. I'll be honest with you. And and uh, and I'm, well, I just just love being here. Yeah. Tell me back to the beginning. What you love about the play itself? I love. Uh, I love the, the huge twists and turns that it takes in a very in very short spaces of time. I mean, I love the tragedy of it. I think it's tragic, and I think it's about I think it's a love story that goes horribly wrong. Um, and maybe I'm a weirdo because I love that. Talk about the role that you play and what you love about him. Well, I like the emotions that he gets to reach. I like his frustration. I like the fact that he's a damaged character. That he's a war veteran. Um, I like the fact that he has delusions of grandeur because he's kind of, you know, an idiot. Uh, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not a particularly nice guy, although he thinks he is, and he's, he's, he's got ideas above his station. He's a very confused young man, and he's been in love with this, this woman who is, he sees you know, on, this, on this pedestal for his entire life, really, and just is presented with this opportunity, and, you know... He, yeah, it's, it, it's the tragedy of him, really. That's what I love about the character. That's what we like as actors, a bit of drama. So, New York, that's the place for us, yeah? New life, new people. I met some GIs during the war, got their addresses, everything. They live in the uh, Bronx. We'll have to look them up. Maybe they can help us with a nightclub. I imagine it'll be very English, very glamorous, sophisticated. They love us over there, they die for the accent. <laughs> I'll do the books, the bar. You'll be front of house, charm everyone. You have to hurry though. Christine will be up soon. Your father's due back. I'll drive us to the station. We'll catch the train on the boat. We're there. How long does it take? Two, three days? A week. A week. Tell me you love me. I love you. Come here. We have to go, Miss Julie. How can you call me Miss now? <laughs> Finian's Rainbow star Kate Baldwin has just released her new solo CD on PS Classics called Let's See What Happens, Songs of Lane and Harburg, and Broadway Beat was there. I like New York in June. How about you? I like a Gershwin tune. How about you? I love a fireside when a storm is due. Burton Lane concert about three years ago um, at the New York Historical Society and fell in love with some of his music. Things, songs that were unfamiliar to me. I mean, many I knew, obviously, Finian's Rainbow stuff, stuff from uh, On a Clear Day. But I didn't know anything from College Swing. I didn't know anything from the film work that he did. And I just thought he was a master of melody. I fell in love with songs like Moments Like This and The World Is In My Arms. And I thought if I were to ever do an album, I would include those songs. But that was three years ago, and I thought, who would buy it? Only my mom. So then, uh, uh, Finian's Rainbow at Encores happened. And I sort of rediscovered both Burton Lane and Yip Harburg in, in a big way. And it was very sort of significant for me. And I started thinking about the album again. And I went and did a concert in uh, Washington, D.C., celebrating the work of, of Sheldon Harnick. And he told a story on stage about the first musical that ever inspired him to become a writer was Finian's Rainbow. And it was the lyrics of Yip Harburg. So then I went, okay, I've got to investigate this little, a little bit more. And I started putting together the ideas for a Burton Lane Yip Harburg 
sort of tribute songbook album. Um, and that's how it started in April. And here we are in October, and we actually have the physical uh, albums in our hands. And uh, it couldn't have happened quick, more quickly, and it couldn't have been more fun. choose songs that everybody knew, but I wanted to give enough of a flavor uh, so that people can recognize a title or two. Uh, obviously, How Are Things in Glockamora is a song that I connect to in a big way. So my uh, music director, Rob Berman, and I took a took a point of view on it that I'm very proud of. Um, my niece was born during the run of uh, the encore's Finian's Rainbow. So we had the idea to to, to make Glockamora into a song uh, for a little girl uh, about her family and about her homeland. And, and to my ears on the album, it sounds like a music box, and then it sort of turns into this Disney storybook f- moment. Um, so that's one of the songs that people will recognize. I'm not doing that song tonight. I'm doing How About You, which is a Burton Lane Ralph Freed song that everybody knows. I like New York in June. How about you? Uh, which has a, a sort of jazzier arrangement that Jonathan Tunick did for me. Um, Jonathan got on board later in the process, but in a big way. He th- wrote three charts for me, two for his big band, 12 instruments, the Broadway Moonlighters. Um, and I think simply because he rarely gets asked to do jazz tunes anymore, and he was so excited to to show off in that way. And so he and he does, and it's just awesome. He did a big band arrangement of "Come Back to Me" from On a Clear Day, and Paris is a Lonely Town, <laughs> which few people know. And maybe if you're a Judy Garland fan, you know you know that song. Um, but it was new to both Jonathan and myself. So those are uh, at least a couple of them. And then you'll hear tonight a song from a show called "Darling of the Day." Um, and it's called That's Something Extra Special. And Yip Harburg wrote the words, and Julie Stein wrote the melody, and I just think it's gorgeous and beautiful, and it reminds me of my husband, so that's why I'm singing it. I'm mad about good books and get my fill And Franklin Roosevelt's looks The new musical Memphis, which is raising the roof nightly at the Schubert Theater, is created by Joe DiPietro and Bon Jovi's David Bryan. It features direction by Christopher Ashley, choreography by Sergio Trujillo, and stars Chad Kimmel and Montego Glover. And we were there on their opening night.
I written the first draft of the script, and my agent sent it out, and it's about the birth of rock and roll, so I wanted an authentic rocker. And then one day, I'm sitting home, and I get a call, hi, Joe, this is uh, David Bryan, I'm the keyboardist for Bon Jovi, and I just read your script, and I heard every song, and I'd like to know how I can uh, write the score. And uh, I was reading the script, and I heard every song, and that's why I called him up, because I hear every song. He's like, great, he hears voices in his head. A little crazy, but, you know. And um, I knew I had, I talked to him at, it was like noon, and I knew I had till 6 o'clock, so I jammed down into my studio, Music of My Soul, it was like, I got, I picked that song, Joe said, pick a song, went down into the studio, got the drum machine, did the keyboards, wrote everything, uh, sang it, did all the background vocals, burned the CD, and FedEx it out, and he had it on his doorstep the next morning. Next day, and I listened to it once, and I said, I hope he's not crazy, because this is the guy. And I am, and I am the guy. He's crazy. He's still the guy. Um, Joe DiPietro handed me a script and a CD of it when we were working on All Shook Up. And uh, I, I put the CD on once, and I played it all night long on an infinite loop. So I really started with the music, which I love the most. And I grew up in the South, so uh, the story of Memphis, Tennessee in the 50s really chimed for me. I have the great luck to play Gladys Calhoun. Uh, she's the mother of Chad Kimball's character, Huey Calhoun. And she starts out... You think you know who she is, that she's kind of this downtrodden, tired, old waitress thing, you know, with a set value system, but she really surprises you. She grows a lot, she changes a lot, and it's really fun for me to get to go on that journey every night. <laughs> My boy loves your sister, we both know that mister. This ain't no temporary phase, cause my boy is stupid, he's been shot by Cupid, so we got to change our intolerant ways. The Reverend helped me find my way to carry on and pray that there's a better day. So won't you come join me, you've got to come join me, join me as I can Uh, I play Mr. Simmons, who's the owner of a small radio station in Memphis, who he's a very cantankerous sort of guy, a very gruff guy, but he gives uh, Huey a chance and uh, uh, sort of becomes sort of uh, tied at the, at the hip with, with Huey all through his career. And uh, uh, he sort of does things for business, and he sees that uh, Huey is a, um, a real... Uh, a real money maker for him, and so he goes where the money is. And uh, uh, but I love the material because it, it's 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 so current right now with what's happening in the country. It's it's it, I just think it's tied to that. And I think that's why audiences are responding to it. The role that I play is that of Felicia Farrell. She's a young woman in Memphis, 1950s, African American, who is a singer and wants very much to come out of segregated clubs and cross over. Um, and the role is so uh, dear to me because I created her. She was written on me. So I've had an opportunity to really um, infuse her with my sensibilities and my likenesses, but I've also been able to draw from the text, in the music and in the written word, and really... Um, um, sharpen her life and make her thoughts and her motions as clear as possible because this is a young woman who has so much to give she just needs to know what she wants to say I love playing Bobby because I, I, I really actually get an arc. You know, he's real shy at the beginning and kind of really doesn't want to do much. <laughs> but with Huey's energy, he ends up having to help him. And then I get a breakout moment in the second act, which is amazing. And I love the material. They wrote a song around me. I'm a, I'm a big guy. I'm a, I got a large tummy. And the fact that they said that's okay to write about and sing about, I... I it was wonderful. All the material is great. All the different songs, the comedy of it, and, and the sadness of it. So I get to you know, experience all that with the different music that they have. So I'm, I'm loving it. Well, Delray Farrell, you know, he, he's, I feel like he's the heartbeat of the piece. You know, uh, he, he's uh, Felicia Farrell's brother. 
and he's the antagonistic person of the show, the antagonistic character of the show. And he keeps everything in line as far as the danger of the racism, um, the the undercurrent of, of knowing, you know, where we should and should not go as far as what the laws were in that time in the 50s and, and wanting to be an entrepreneur in that time, you know. He's a producer and he wants to, nothing more than to get his sister's voice out there to for the whole world to hear. Well, I, uh, Huey Calhoun, I, I think, is um, one of my favorite roles because, if he is my favorite role, because he he is he is an everyman. Um, he's not a, you know, although you know I am handsome, but he's not some suave, handsome, debonair leading man. He's he's everyman. He's uh, you know, and I think that that's why the audience uh, gets him is that he has his quirks and his and his and his. Uh, offbeat nature but he still has uh, uh, something that he can give to the world and for those people who come to the show who feel like they you know aren't that you know leading man or leading lady you know they kind of look to him and say okay this guy is an idiot but he gets something done and so I, I think that that's what I love about him most of all is that he is accessible uh, to everyone there comes a time when muddy waters run rough there comes a point when a man has had enough Like a friend who always stands by me, yeah 